Go for it, Charles. Oh, uh, so I think uh, where a lot of the HTML of the wire, hot wire stuff for Rails comes from is uh, that if you're building a monolith in a smaller environment and you want to keep the initial push out uh, small, that's definitely a win. So like professional, right now I'm working on a project uh, in Magento that essentially we push a huge blob of JavaScript to the client every time. And, you know, Magento is an e-commerce platform. So if you want to do things like configurable products, bringing those in later and not having to take that entire blob of JavaScript and all the content in one go can increase your initial page load time and have faster content full paints, which a lot of e-commerce people are super, super sensitive to for things like page rank and search engine visibility. I think I would probably echo that. Um, we were looking at Hotwire hot wire specifically for the efficiency gains of development. Um, we don't, for the applications that we're writing, we don't want to write JavaScript. Um, and the reason is we don't want to have two sets of disciplines. We've, we're actually bringing some teams up to speed on development in Rails that have never done Rails or JavaScript development before. And anytime that we have like a Rails and a React application, it's either going to be a really thin API on the Rails side, or it's going to be some comp combination of like the templates on the Rails side and also the templates in the React JSX or something like that. And then the question is always ambiguous of where do I go to look for the template? Um, and we don't, we want to simplify that, that mental model for people who are going to be developing and maintaining this application after we're done. So having written a ton of JavaScript and written a ton of Rails, um, my goal in this project specifically is reduce the amount of one of those two things that I have to write. And because we have to have a server side component and it's written in Rails, I want to reduce as much JavaScript as I can. And so, uh, th that's really the, I think the key driver for, for us on this project is how much can we actually cut out of having to write two applications where the language between them is JSON. And then we have to do a bunch of serialization and deserialization. And then we have two sets of the same state in two different places, one on the browser and one on the server. If we can reduce that down and essentially only have the server have that state, but still be able to have those sort of really live reactive kind of pages that you can click on some, something and you know parts of the page update other parts don't without the full page reload i think that's the kind of experience that we're trying to build that's very similar to like a really thick javascript app but without having the diligence of having to write two applications write the layer in between those things all the serialization and all of that um that that's really i think the benefit of of hotwire for me is is the the simplification, we don't have a big team working on this, right? We have four developers total, and we don't want to have to say, well, you two are front end developers and you two are back end developers. Now go and learn your disciplines, but you know, have very little crossover. We want them to be able to, to, to manage the whole thing. So, from my perspective, that's really the benefit is, is having that like server side state rather than having state on both sides. Thanks, Steve. I didn't uh, look entirely for a uh, stimulus reflex, but I think the same, uh, approach is the same, right? But I don't know why people are uh, choosing hotwire uh, or stimulus reflex. Uh, do you know anything about this? What was the second one? A stimulus reflex. Oh, oh. Hotwire is, um, hotwire uses stimulus, right? I don't know about the reflex mm -hmm. side of that, but stimulus is one of the, the branded things inside of the hotwire umbrella, as, as I've learned. Um, I don't like the magic of stimulus. Um, in fact, I felt it like it was kind of a failure when we had to drop to stimulus in order to do something that I thought should be like part of Turbo. Um, and I do kind of still feel that way. Like there's some things that Turbo should support better, um, but we can get there with stimulus. Uh, I think it feels a little bit weird that like the guide for stimulus says, Here's a way to do it, and here's what we're doing on hey.com for for email because it's Basecamp writing this stuff, right? Um, so when they say stuff like here's a way to use it, and it's stimulus making a call to the server via regular endpoint and returning HTML snippet like a partial from that, and then like dropping it into the inner HTML, that kind of felt like a weird throwback to the old days before we had things like React and, and some of the other stuff. 
So that was a little bit weird. Uh, it works really well, but it also feels bad. And I don't know how to reconcile those two things. Um, I don't know why you would choose one, you know, one approach of like HTML over the wire versus a different approach for Rails. But um, that, that's been my own experience is that stimulus is magic and not necessarily the good kind. Yeah. Robin, I saw you smile there. <laughs> Um, it has a really uh, too much boilerplate uh, code too. Yeah, it makes your HTML look really, really big. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, did anyone use, um, I don't know, Turbo uh, mobile sites, which was, uh, um, okay. I haven't used the native stuff, that, that, like the third part of Hotwire. I haven't used that third part yet for anything. And that still seems like it's under development if I understand it correctly. Actually, it was uh, TrueBolinks iOS and TrueBolinks uh, Android before. And I think uh, they just changed the name of it. I burned <laughs> TurboLinks out of every Rails project that I started with Fire. That was, that was my default thing, because it would break in ways that were so subtle and so messed up that it would take me hours mm. to figure out why. And that's essentially, as far as I can tell, what Turbo Drive is now. Um, and turbo drive still causes me problems. I don't, I don't like that. Turbo frames and streams, I like a lot because in my mental model, I can say, here's an area of the screen that I want to update quickly. And so as a result, I'm going to put it in a frame and then I can stream something new to that frame. And I like that a lot. Like that part of the mental model works for me. Turbo drive still feels kind of like, okay, you're going to prefetch this URL in advance and then just replace the, the window, like the DOM of the window. That's the document it just feels like that part I just want to rip out. So yeah, turbo links, I've never been a fan of, and I actually stayed away from Hotwire at first because of the, the link to turbo links. Um, that, that part makes me really hesitant to use it. And I think there's a long way to go for me to really, really like it and start maybe even using turbo drive on purpose. <laughs> Uh, that's my my biggest reason for not having touched Hotwire yet. So I, that you might have convinced me to give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, TurboLinks was like, oh, how, what I I always forget the command line argument to remove TurboLinks from the Rails generator for the new project. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's not like if you just ignore ignore Turbo Drive, like disable Turbo at the root level of the DOM, and then add it in the places where you want that it works a lot better than sort of just buying in wholesale to this whole idea of turbo as a whole unit. Um, that, that's what I found at least. Cause I don't want it intercepting my logout button link and doing something with that so that I have to override that. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't match well with what I wanna do when I'm working in Rails. Um, and I rip out the unobtrusive JavaScript thing every time too. But in this case, is being replaced by that, but there isn't like a full replacement yet. So there's parts of it that are still feeling a little bit like they're in flight. But Bill, what's been your experience on it? I know that I've talked a lot about sort of how I feel about it. What do you think about how we've used it so far? <laughs> no, I mean, um, my use, I haven't been using it quite as long as you have, and I haven't uh, dug as deep, but kind of echoing your sentiment from earlier, it feels like the early days of Rails development before a lot of the idioms were settled upon and and um, Ruby being a pretty expressive language, you could mangle it in many different ways. And, um, and so, yeah, I think it's still really immature, but it is fascinating the things that you can do with it and um, the little bit that we've done with like the auto suggest stuff and, um, you know, like a problem that was really kind of difficult to solve um, with uh, client side code, uh, we were able to somewhat elegantly maybe, um, you know, craft a solution um, that, yeah, it feels wonky, but again, it feels like the Wild West days of early Ruby development. And um, But it, it'll be interesting to see it kind of uh, evolve over the course of time. For that auto suggest specifically, it was like a type ahead kind of thing with known information on the server, but not on the client. And what was interesting about that was how long it took us to get to the solution versus how many lines of code were actually there at the end. I, I think it took us like a half of a day to figure out how to get all that stuff working together. And at, when we were done, there were like eight lines of JavaScript and like maybe 10 lines of Ruby. 
So it was weird because the amount, it was disproportionate, the amount of time that we spent thrashing and stimulus and trying to figure all that stuff out versus that solution, if we had done it with like a Rails back end and a, and a React front end and all the stuff in between would have been significant, significantly larger in terms of getting Webpack set up with React and getting all those things working and then having a React component that talks to the server and having all of that like inner intercommunication and everything. Um, this is a much simpler model when we're done, but it took us so long to get there because of all the magic of stimulus and how that stuff works that like, I like where we ended up. I don't like the journey that we took to get there. <laughs> I know Reels people uh, doesn't like uh, JavaScript too much, but I really like using uh, Webpacker because it really simplifies things. And I think it was a really good uh, approach for uh, using JavaScript. But um, as far as I see, uh, for now, Reels uh, core team is looking for uh, migrating to Snowpack. And do you know anything about that? because I'm a bit confused about it. Do they want to uh, <laughs> don't use JavaScript anymore? Or <laughs> do they want to make things harder for us? <laughs> <laughs> I hope they don't want to make things harder. Uh, if you look at any of the stuff that they say, generally speaking about JavaScript, they're looking at trying to remove as much as possible. Uh, I, I think that whole asset pipeline, like Sprockets thing versus Webpacker is just a big confusing mess right now. Um, mm -hmm. So I build it, I, when we build new Rails projects uh, that I'm working on, we build it with Webpacker and then we delete the assets folder on the Rails side so that people don't accidentally put something in the wrong place and then you know reference it. You can use the Webpack asset tag and reference it from, from Rails or from the JavaScript side. And that to me is like a win. So I like the Webpacker stuff. I don't know if, uh, I, I don't know the other thing you were talking about. I hope they don't switch away from it. I'm hoping that they eventually move toward Webpacker more and more, but. I'm interested now to. more about what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I will send a link about it. Yeah, I'd be interested to know more about that. I, I've, I maintain a couple of very large uh, aged Rails projects now. And when you get to the point where you have 20 or 30 packs, Webpacker is very slow and very cumbersome to work with. Um, we have been uh, experimenting with Vite as an alternative to Webpacker, and it seems like a very good alternative so far. That's interesting. I have seen the slowness there. Like we we don't have that many React components on this project that the, the original project preceding the one that we're working with Hotwire with. Um, and it takes, I mean, we were at one point timing out after five minutes of building JavaScript and that feels bad. Um, part of that was a bug with Webpacker, I think that, that they fixed, but we're there still was an out of memory error. Yeah, the, we're still in the back would hit and then it would just fail completely. It would not even output a line saying why. <laughs> yeah, we were having problems with very long build times with not that much JavaScript code, but um, I think we're down around the two minute range. It's still kind of like, okay, we built all the rails and all the dependencies and everything. And it was like a minute and then we're into the Webpacker part of it. And it's like, well, I guess we need to go get some coffee now. <laughs> yeah, I happen to be working on, on CI configuration for Webpack builds right now. And that is the most time consuming thing of, of any build. And that includes installing yarn and bundler from scratch. Uh, like, like all of the dependencies from scratch. Um, yeah, web webpacker tends to be really slow. I am curious whether, uh, whether it's possible to, um, eliminate webpacker from the project. If you're using hotwire, like so you just need any JavaScript package. How do you manage assets and stuff? Do you do the same thing with like what I was saying, you just drop everything out of the assets folder completely and use the uh, the packs for it. One one project that I'm working on right now in particular has both assets and webpack, which is even worse. But but honestly, assets are very simple and fast in comparison. Yeah, I, I think when I'm thinking about these things, I'm thinking about how do I remove decision points, um, and maybe that's just where I'm at as a developer. <laughs> but I try to think, you know, if I were coming into this project cold and I wanted to know where to go definitively to find the answer to this. If I have to choose between a Rails template or a React component, that's kind of a lose for me. Or if I have to if I have to go into the assets folder versus into the packs folder, that's kind of a lose because then, you know, you're spending a lot of time just trying to figure out where things are versus like, how do I actually make the change meaningfully that I want to do? So that, that's kind of how I approach these things myself. Um, we have all of our SAS and all of our images and all of our JavaScript through Webpacker right now. And so um, it lets us do things like interpolate SAS variables in our JavaScript, which is cool. 
Um, and I didn't know that was a thing until a couple of years ago, but at the same time, so you can do like theme colors in your code, um, but it does make things kind of slow a little bit, I think. This morning, I happened to uh, listen to an episode from the Remote Ruby podcast, and that was specifically on Skypack and Snowpack. So Snowpack being apparently an equivalent of Vite and a replacement also for Webpack, Webpacker, Webpack more precisely. You can share the link if you want. It was interesting to hear about those, um, yeah, possibility to replace uh, Webpack. And they were talking about, oh, a lot of us are using Webpack without really knowing what happens in there and how to fix when it fails. I mean, I think that's kind of true of Webpack in general, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like when we actually manage it more firsthand on Phoenix apps and stuff like that, um, we get it working. <laughs> and then we try not to touch it, <laughs> which is an interesting approach for a build tool. Um, I like to geek out on build tools. I like to get Webpack working and then not touch it. But it seemed to be, I remember uh, jumping from Rails 3 to Rails 5 and having a very bad time with, with Webpack. And then when I created two apps with Rails 6 and 6.1, everything was a lot smoother already. So that was nice. But yeah, having it built in with those generators is nice. You say, yeah, use Webpack, and I'm going to use React. So you might as well put it in there. And then, yeah, everything's pretty nice that way. I found the same thing. I, I, Webpacker had a dirty name for me for a while because of the pain that people were experiencing back around those days, too. You don't have any code example of, of uh, Outwire and stuff to, to share? Yeah, I can, I can show you what we did kind of real quickly. I've tried to extract it into a little standalone Rails app um, because I wanted to write a blog post about it just to kind of on a series of posts that we're doing about um, what Tim laid out for a specific client that um, uh, the, you know, reducing the number of lines of JavaScript. We don't hate JavaScript. We're, you know, in, let me just say that out loud, but uh, for this particular client, it makes a lot of sense. It helps them with hiring, you know, if they can hire just for one stack instead of, um, uh, you know, two stack front and uh, uh, rear end development and, um, that kind of thing. So for a number of strategic reasons uh, for this particular client, that's why it's a priority for us. So anyway, all that said, let me go ahead and screen share. Up, oh, your host, Tim, can you make me host so I can screen share? We Yeah, I, this the Zoom configuration for this one yeah, weird is too. weird. We'll have to go through and all right, I think this. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, maybe, there we go. Let me get to this guy. And um, this is the guts of the commit. There's a bunch of other little commits where we did set up, but um, do I, I've got the app running. Let me open, and this is Linux subsystem for Windows and we've got to make little adjustments for that. Um, I have to run X right now to get a native terminal open. While you're doing that, does anybody else use Windows now for Ruby development? It's it's viable for that and for Elixir. Um, yeah. It's really interesting. It's viable, it works. There are still some weird workarounds that they've actually fixed in like beta builds and stuff, but the WSL stuff is legit. I have a really fast Windows machine and I can run these tests and get this get get Rails development working really really well, um, and I would have I'd, I'd laugh at myself a year ago for saying that now. <laughs> it's so ugly, but I'm sorry about that. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it is true. It's um, the it it has been a transition. I've been working uh, on Max forever, and then uh, this client again. This was like kind of a client dependency. Um, 
that they're all their existing or much of their existing infrastructure is Windows, Microsoft stack. And, and we were introducing this weird, you know, Ruby and, and all of this to them. And, uh, um, but we were able to move really fast with it. So, you know, it got their attention. Tim, I'm stealing his thunder. He was the one started with this client. They did some amazing work and I wish we could share um, about this client. But um, so I, but the problem was they have so much infrastructure that they rely on just to do their development. There was no way I could get it all working on. My, well, I was, I have it working on my little MacBook Pro over here, but uh it was just so cumbersome, um, uh, just chewing up memory and um, disk space and all that stuff. So I bought this really El Cheapo um, Windows uh, gaming system and everything just runs so well on it. Like you can get a heck of a lot of performance on a Windows box for the buck than you can um, from Apple, unfortunately. But anyway, I, I will say I'm going to go back to the Mac as soon as I yeah yeah <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not, like selling a windows machine here for to you but uh no. incredible. that's that's the interesting part it's yeah, yeah. it was interesting it took some time but back for you. anyway anyway this is just a really simple rails app in my former career um i may look like an old seasoned software developer but i was an aircraft mechanic for almost 20 years before i came to uh software development um and one of the things we always had trouble with was locating screws or fasteners or rivets, um, whatever the, the proper rivet. But we, you kind of memorize these, these funny, uh, in, in the US anyway, we have what are called mill spec, which is a military spec, which is interesting because a lot of our technology comes out of the military and yada, yada. But part naming is one of those things. But you kind of have, an idea of what the part name should be. And uh, um, so I did this little demo app um, where I can, you know, do auto suggest. And this is going, this is going from the front end. I'm just typing in characters and it says, now I know my list down here is not very impressive. There's five things I could put like 2000 in there and this would be a little bit better of a demo but then I can select from it and imagine that there's another div down here. That's, I don't know, displaying an image. I haven't got that far in the, in my little demo app, but you know, we could display more information than just what happened here in the auto select. But you see, this is no minimal JavaScript involved here. It's selected that list and I can reset the search and I can do my NAS parts and I select one of them and, um, I know not very impressive uh, and you think, oh, that's easy enough to do with JavaScript, but here is the, um, the Ruby code that uh, essentially did that. Um, I mean, the routes are kind of easy. I, you know, we just use the normal CRUD routes, but we um, added in um, these non restful, uh, routes that like for the auto suggest and to to fetch the result and to return and to reset our search that was kind of straightforward um sorry zoom controls getting in the way and i got to remember my windows key bindings here um the controller itself was just adding those guys in um the, those auto suggest routes. And the interesting bit is we create, you know, you can create partials and just render those back as HTML. And we'll see the hot wire part, but it, it is, it's not, we're not sending JSON back. This is just normal. Any Ruby developer would come in here and say, oh yeah, I know how that works without really having to think, you know, render as JSON or whatever, uh, um, this big blob of, of data or whatever, you just say, use all your Rails stuff and send that back, you know, send the HTML back. So um, I think any, any Rails developer can look at this and see exactly what's going on. Um, I'll get to the JavaScript last. I mean, and it's, it's not really interesting. Um, the, we did a little bit with, uh, let's see. Yeah, like the markup, this will probably be the, 
the much better part. Let me do, see if I get my, yeah. Um, so we do, you know, like the data controller that controls this, the stimulus controller is called auto suggest. And then you can set values in that controller by passing them to this uh, data attribute, data auto suggest. Here's my fetch URL, which fetches the parts, the reset URL, the suggest URL. Um, what other bits in here? And then we set targets. Like here's where I'm, here's the uh, unordered list where I'm gonna um, display the, uh, the results. Um, here's a data action for the auto suggest controllers reset method. Um, and we do data test. I've got some specs in here that check that all this stuff functions as expected. Here's our turbo frame tag for the parts so that when we reset that, um, the, the parts are restored where they were. And then uh, let's see what else here, close that guy. And then of course the partials, we just pull the partial out um, for each, each part, this is what gets rendered for that particular part. And then we created the little auto suggest HTML that uh, adds these line items, these uh, bits of HTML that get sent back as the line item for each particular part. And then the really kind of interesting bit, let me open this up, is you set static values. You just import the controller from stimulus. You define that. Um, we set a values uh, array containing or uh, object containing, you know, the, those values that we set on the in the view for the fetch URL, reset URL. Um, our targets are the targets that we're using, the bits, the turbo uh, frame tags that will be targeting for our data. Um, reset just resets that, uh, that little input where you're inputting the text value um, and then fetches the reset URL uh, the, uh, or fetches from the reset URL, gets the response back and then just replaces the inner HTML on the reset target with the HTML that it receives back from Rails. Lookup's pretty simple. We just we fetch from the suggest URL the part number, the value that's been typed into that uh, part number input. Um, then response, response text. Some of this has been cur is, cargo culted from the um, from the stimulus docs. So those three lines yeah. of code are essentially like this is kind of a pattern that we're still evaluating really, but mm. passing in that like static URL and then fetching from yeah. it and then replacing the inner HTML is like straight from the stimulus docs for how you can do it. And I saw that and I kind of like held my nose at first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I still kind of do like I see this and I'm like, am I proud of this? I don't know. It's really responsive and fast. And I didn't write, I didn't like attach a react component to a DOM element. And I don't have a bunch of like ceremony at the beginning of like going and asynchronously fetching stuff and all that. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, it doesn't feel like I'm a real JavaScript developer. That's like a weird, I don't know. Those two yeah. together with each other don't feel quite right. Like I'm, I'm gatekeeping myself from being a good JavaScript developer when I think about this code. That's, I don't know how healthy that is. <laughs> right, and and I feel the same way. Except for it's almost an advantage with this particular client because the developers we're mentoring don't have a ton of JavaScript um, experience anyway, so. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like, yeah, follow this recipe from the stimulus stocks and you'll be fine. You'll be on the golden path, but it's, yeah, I, I, I feel the same way, uh, Tim. What's kind of interesting about this to me is, um, it does, it feels kind of almost like an embellished form of jQuery where some of the, the plumbing is hooked up for you 
and you're just writing more things that look like straight JavaScript or jQuery, um, that's cool. The thing that I really like about this is that I don't have to teach people a new router. I don't have to teach people a new way of instantiating like client objects. Um, I don't have to teach people how to maintain state and synchronize between two different applications, one running on a server and one running on the browser. So there's a lot of wins for what aesthetically doesn't look very good to me. And right. like, do I just hold my nose and I'm okay with that? Or is there a better way to, like, is there a way to push this forward so that it does feel like more disciplined approach in the JavaScript? Like, have we created a situation where you're not a real JavaScript developer if you're not writing components and doing things? Or have we created a situation where that is the right thing for us to do as an industry, even though sometimes it feels bad how much you have to know just to write something good in a web application? There's a lot of things that this on the surface is just like, oh, this is great. And on right underneath that feels like existential industry questions. <laughs> <laughs> If I may, is it really an industry question or per project per team question you have to ask yourself? As you said, some teams don't have enough JavaScript knowledge to jump into React or Vue. Yeah, that's a good question. I think when I'm trying to bootstrap somebody new on really any web project that I've written in the last five years, I immediately feel apologetic about having two apps that you have to maintain, right? Like it's what I do. And prior to Hotwire and prior to LiveView, it was really the only way to build applications that could do things the way that we needed them to with, with the modern era of web development. You have to write JavaScript and you have to really kind of embrace it and like it in order to do something well. And then that means necessarily you're building a layer in between of communication. And then you have to make a decision on any new thing that you build. Does it belong mostly in the server or mostly in the client or some mix of those things? And I, I think that's an industry problem. I think that's kind of the, the boat that we're in as an industry of, of web, web development specifically. Um, there are two platforms every time that you have an app that you're writing that you could run code on and deciding which computer you're going to run the code on in any sense that is like sort of up in the air that you you know you could make that decision either way potentially and then have to defend that decision to somebody new on the project is hard i don't like that feeling <laughs> i've never taught someone code that i worked with and was not apologetic so that <laughs> seems perfectly natural <laughs> I but, guess but, that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> but but I also think that it, you know, making that decision based on let's say the the team makeup, we don't have we don't have any JavaScript specialists, therefore we'll we'll make this choice. It also means that going forward, you're not going to attract any, right? right. Someone who who wants to work deeply in JavaScript just wants to continue working in that environment. Right. Yeah, front end disciplines are attracted to a lot of people, especially to the point where like uh, there are people who learn react and want to do node because of that because they want that single stack kind of feel and they choose that route and that's a totally valid route to do um oh, that single stack sort of lie but sure right i <laughs> it's mean all language but it's not the same environment <laughs> right like we're writing hotwire so we're not writing javascript but look at how much javascript we wrote yeah yeah <laughs> i mean that's just i think that's kind of the nature of it but um, yeah. Having that single language, at least, of the front end and the back end, and not really necessarily having to maintain two states. That, that I think, is, is probably just as big as anything, is if mm -hmm. I have a cache of information on the browser, and I have information in the database, and having to keep those things in sync, now we're into cache and validation and like all kinds of stuff that's really hard, right? And um, if we can avoid that problem, whether it be through more JavaScript or through, um, you know, a different way of approaching it. I think there's a win there that if we, if we can find the right balance. I'm curious um, about, I'm curious about two things. One is the, the, the timing of these actions. So uh, if you have a slow connection or the server or the backend is running slow, is there a graceful degradation? Um, Interestingly, I think that Rails has a good solution to this. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it has a good solution to that and that it does fall back to a traditional post 
like if you're using turbo stuff and you've got a form it will try to do a request that is a turbo stream kind of a request it'll it actually requests it during using a different kind of uh, content type and so it says i'll accept turbo streams and then the rails app can do a respond to with that um, but if you do a normal form post, it can actually just return the re traditional sort of request response thing. So there are some things that are like good there. Um, that is a weakness of all of this kind of event driven kind of partial update stuff is if you have a, a slow connection, it doesn't. I, I'd say it's probably not as you can't respond to it as gracefully as you can with like a react side thing or if you have like a local storage kind of an approach. Um, those things can you can do offline stuff better with that. Um, the door isn't closed to that here, but it's really not designed for that, as far as I can tell. Yeah, it looks like there's an opportunity to, to insert some code in there, but then you have to deal with the timing of, mm -hmm. did the fetch complete fast enough, things like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm also curious about what tests look like. Do, the, do you have to do um, Capybara tests to, to get any Yeah, tests? we just did straight up Capybara. You can, and... because it goes through the router, though, you can make requests that use the right content types and you can actually mm -hmm. test that the partials and things that come back are what you're looking for. I haven't seen any test helpers. We haven't dug that far into it. Right. I haven't seen any like R spec test helpers that are like turbo test, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, but you can just inspect the outcome. The, the turbo streams is just HTML, right? So it says turbo stream and here's the target. And then there's that. And then there's another, you can do multiple turbo streams to different targets. And you can just test the, the output of that without necessarily having to drive it through a browser. Um, what we've done has all been capybara at this point, though, because we're yeah. still testing out how the interactions feel, and that's more of like a, a full integration kind of a thing. Here, you just saw the yeah, you just saw the you know the request going out to the uh, server, and then it just returns the response is just HTML. Yeah, can you look at the headers of that real quick? Yeah. This is the interesting part for me. If you scroll down and look at the response headers um oh no yeah i want to say the response is, like, is that's just a text html oh this is because we're actually just doing a regular request response but cycle yeah. the, the stimulus um there's one that we do that streams though right or no did you do any of the turbo stream stuff no, oh, no. okay there's um, the turbo stream stuff is a little bit different, but I think you can you can test it either through Capybara yeah. or through just a regular request spec. Yeah. But it looks like this. All it does is it wraps things in turbo streams that target a certain frame on the screen. But, but while it, it might be valuable to do some unit tests against your requests, uh, hmm. there's no contract that exists between uh, the, the the, the parts of JavaScript that you wrote that rely on those and those request specs, right? So it, it seems like a bad idea right. anyway. Yeah. It would it would it would seem like it would be better tested differently. Like you wouldn't necessarily test at the request level if you're trying to make sure that auto suggest is returning the right things. You might want to test like the query stuff more closer to the model or wherever the thing is that's running those queries. And then if you're looking for those interactions, I mean Capybara's probably got you covered for that if it's not too slow. Um, if you're really optimizing your test suite, you could probably do something different. But I think those two cases, those two test kinds would cover the two cases that you're looking for, the correctness and also those interactions that you're looking for. Yeah, we haven't really dug into that much as far as mm -hmm. requests go. That, that's an interesting. Yeah, that's yeah, good to know. Um, I left this highlighted up here. It's been sitting here a while because this one cost us some time. <laughs> um, the data action, uh, if your element you're targeting targeting an action with a stimulus action is not naturally clickable, does not um, respond to a click event. Uh, you have to add that uh, to, to the data action with the, you know, you, you do this little like skinny arrow, maybe, uh, you know, click dash greater than whatever syntax. So, um, that took us a little while. I won't say how long specifically, but uh, of if there are any big gotchas, pay attention to that portion of the uh, the docs because um, you can click on thing all day and it won't fire that yeah, action no, that event. No console.log will save you from that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's, there's two things I think that are not awesome magic when it comes to stimulus specifically. One is the default action isn't necessarily something that you'd you'd 
think about, right? Like, what is the default action for an LI? I, there isn't one apparently, right? But for a text field, it's on change. You may not want the on change, yeah. right? You might want on key press or something like that. So I think I'm coming to this the conclusion that you should always specify which event you want to listen to, um, just to be clear, so you don't lose yeah. hours on trying to read the docs and you miss that one line that says do this. Um, the other thing is the the conventions for naming things is really unfortunate because there's like magical conversion between kebab case underscores like um, um, snake casing, kebab casing, and, and camel casing. And you have to name things in the JavaScript. They're trying to do the right thing for the different languages and different document types, but it's really messed up, I think, trying to figure out how to translate between those. Because you have to do the translation just like it does the translations, right? So you're doing attribute tags with kebab case, and then you're doing file names with kebab case, but then your class names are camel case. And there's a little bit of that like bad magic, but it's exacerbated here versus where in Ruby, at least you can kind of get there in this. I've I've spent time saying, okay, and this is how this works in like a pairing session. And then we go and look at it. It doesn't work that way at all. <laughs> it's like, okay, five times in, you're finally like, fine, everything gets title or camel cased. And we're just going to like not rely on the magic at all. Uh, that part. Right. I don't think it's be to this because I, I we run into the same no. thing in almost every environment yeah. where we're translating. Yeah. GraphQL, for example, or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, active model we, serializer, and and like the Rails to JavaScript thing is really highlights that as well. Like we've used humps a lot, right? Like you use humps yeah. on the JavaScript side to like take all of the snake cased keys and convert them to camel cased keys because that's what JavaScript really wants to use. Like that's not a a problem specific to stimulus, but it just kind of exacerbates it. It highlights that problem even more because it's got so much magic around that. And it totally underscores our cowardice and naming of things here because in to the non-native uh, English speakers, auto suggest is usually hyphenated in English. So we just ran it together. And if you look at our routes, they're nice, you know, auto suggest fetch and reset. We originally had different names and wiring things up. We said, you know what, we're just gonna kick the can. We're gonna take the coward's way out, choose simple names and move on. <laughs> you know, so Everything is one word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, based off the conversation, since we're coming close to here to, to one o'clock, uh, are you more or less or neutrally inclined to pick up more hot wire based off the conversation? Uh, it, it's funny. Uh, I think you, you, you... You talked a bit about uh, jQuery and how it reminds you of this. And also, uh, as you were explaining how it works and the fact that HTML was sent back, it does remind me of uh, some earlier days with Ruby apps, Rails apps. And it's quite funny. Um, I think for some projects, I'll be quite inclined to, to try to use it um, because um, I'm not so good at JavaScript and I don't have to worry too much about this, at least to make a prototype. Um, mostly for for most of my clients, there is always both front end back end teams already, and uh, I think the front end ones might not be so happy to jump back to Ruby. I know some of them not keen on Ruby. Don't know why. Yeah, those are fighting words when you say I want to minimize the JavaScript in this application to some people. It isn't that we necessarily dislike JavaScript, it's that we dislike two languages in two states, two sets of the same state everywhere. Yeah, that's that's funny. Uh, wherever there's a practice already of front end development, I think this is probably not gonna take hold very much. Um, but there are entire applications now being built on it that are like the hey.com stuff where they're like embracing this in wholesale and have been embracing it for a long time that, uh, I don't know, I was looked at it from a distance with like a long stick and kind of poked at it, but never really wanted to like dive in. But Live View has changed my perspective on things a lot. And I think, you know, even if even if I'm not working actively on a Phoenix application with Live View, which has its pluses and minuses as well, it has caused me to think about it differently uh, about web development and JavaScript in general. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I agree. I'm also a little more inclined to at least give it a try. Um, but the project that I feel is the best candidate for that is one where I, I built a standalone Rails app that's just a GraphQL API. Um, it has no assets in it, and I love the fact that it has no asset pipeline. Um, so so that, that means another project, which means the back end then has to connect to GraphQL, which I've never 
touched and I'm not sure that I want to. <laughs> So I am curious if you if you already had if you already have a GraphQL API and you are already using I don't know React or, or something Vue, um, would you would you pick this if you don't already have a Rails app that you can set it on top of? That's interesting. That wasn't the question I was expecting you to ask, and now I'm kind of jarred. I don't know how to answer the one you did. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can answer the other question you were thinking. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, you know, if you already have a React part of your application, would you try to mix this into an existing application? Oh. Well, and I think that's I actually that. what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do a little bit of strangling vine on that, but uh, that clouded me from being able to actually hear what you actually asked. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you were starting from scratch and you know that your Rails app is not the database, is not going to connect directly to the database, right? So if you're not the host of the active record models, um, so you're going to have to implement APIs. Would you rather implement them in Ruby and then, you know, and then do this on top of that, or would you be inclined to, to not use, or to, to, to do a front end, a pure front end framework? And I, and I, I, I guess the question. answer is <laughs> someone who's not just a Ruby developer, right? I mean, right, right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I could disintermediate Ruby um, in that situation. I might just go for a front end framework, but um, it's got to get hosted somewhere, right? That's that would be the challenge of like how would it the the, de the devil's in the details on that one, I think. Huh. That's my answer. I don't know. What, what did everybody else think? <laughs> No, I was just going to say what you said. It's got to be hosted somewhere, and the front end's going to have to call an API one way or the other. You know, I guess maybe the only thing Rails could help with is hosting. <laughs> you know, simple, and that's, I don't know. Yeah, the devil is truly in the details there. John, was this your first look at uh, Hotwire, or have you played with it at all yourself? No, I mean, I haven't really touched Rails since. We worked on a project a year and a half, two yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. Aside from, I started looking at it for a few days. Yeah, yeah. Last week, and that was just pretty basic. So. Yeah. How much uh, live wire were you doing, or live view? Excuse me, live wire. <laughs> Conflating. Uh not, not a ton since uh, the other project that we were on. Um, they had it in. I mean, it's been like all of the projects that we've worked on at some point together, Bill, I think is like yeah. where we've seen some live live view usage, but um, the most recent project I just came off of, they weren't, they weren't using it. So that's, that was like yeah. seven, eight months or something. I was on that and I haven't really gone back to touch it since aside from like, I was playing with, the the live book stuff in the last couple of weeks and you know it's using live view and the covers and stuff to do updates but yeah, yeah i i would be interested to get back into like doing a live view application from scratch again and and this time around like the first time i i tried to attempt it i kind of like just started off with uh, do, doing what i knew and then i i kind of like injected it in with like a render live components kind of approach and then started building up from there. And I would like to start with um, full blown, just getting rid of the, the controller altogether, just do live right from the, the router, do live routes and then get used to um, putting all the information into the socket that I need with plugs and stuff. So see how that would work. here's the thing that I am stumbling on and missing the most on the Rails side of this is that with Live View, those sockets can communicate whenever they need to with the browser, right? Any event within the system can trigger an update to a Live View component on the screen and change it. And it, and it doesn't have to be browser initiated, right? That's what's really throwing me off about Hotwire is that I can only stream to frames from within a thing that the browser has requested, right? So mm -hmm. I have to like initiate some action on the browser side that is streams compliant. And then the, then the server can return multiple streams for multiple frames and update them all at the same time. 
but I can't have a truly event driven system on the server side mm -hmm. that updates the client that way w without bolting something else on. And I feel like I, I would have to build that in with WebSockets. I'd have to build a channel connection in where the server could send down, hey, could you just like make a, c a connection with a content accept type of stream so that I can give you more information that way? <laughs> And that mm -hmm. feels pretty broken compared to what LiveView does, right? With right. just that really efficient over the over the WebSocket HTML update stuff, where it's not even sending HTML, right? It's sending parameters that need to be replaced inside of HTML. Like that approach, I'm trying to replicate it, and every time I do that, I get stuck, and then I have to reach for Turbo Drive on the one side or Stimulus on the other side, and I can't get there with Frames and Streams, which is where it seems like it's the most natural fit. So that right there is like the reason that I really want to see Hotwire develop a little bit more. And I'm hoping they're moving in that direction so that it can be really a truly server event driven system. But either I'm missing it or it's just not there yet. So are you expecting Hotwire to migrate to WebSockets then or? Well, so, so Rails already has channels. They already have the WebSocket framework and so like phoenix built live they built phoenix right. live view stuff on top of the web sockets there mm -hmm. but hotwire kind of predates the channel stuff if because it came from turbo links okay. and so i expected them to layer that stuff off on top of web sockets but right. it's as far as i can tell it's not it's really layered on top of the traditional request response cycle and right. traditional javascript stuff and I'd love to see them move in that direction and let the server be more event pushing on as far as streams and frames go. I'd love to be able from the Rails side to say, you know, you asked me for this information that's like way over here or somebody mm -hmm. updated this record over here. And now I want to stream to any client that's got this frame. Like I want to be able to do that the way that I would with live view and I, I can't. Which I, I mean, I don't, I don't really know another way to do that aside from WebSockets, right? There really isn't other than like a, a long pole, which is essentially like a WebSocket, right? Right. The right. fallback for WebSocket. And we're using, I mean, we're using channels. The, the so fallback is interesting though, that you've, you've got, and maybe that's something that they, they could still keep. It would be a fair amount of wire up and stuff though, like duplicating everything. But if they had the WebSocket with a fallback to the polling, and and uh and everything that would be at least interesting in terms of like the pro the problems we've had with live view applications where they have like poor you know mobile si service signal or whatever and it it just doesn't work and there's no real fallback to kind of this this uh you know async kind of we'll we'll just do the the fetch and like it's it's not a great user experience, but it's slightly better than what Live View gives you, which is broken. And usually, what we do is just, you know, if if your your web connection or your, your sockets are disconnected, we, you know, for any period of time, we'll we'll just tell them like, hey, you you can't use this. So like, we'll we'll kind of give them like a you're disconnected, you don't have a good connection kind of thing. You just spurred an idea for maybe for the next time. In this application, we're not using Hotwire like on the on the the one application that, that we built, but the way we designed it, you could be connected to the same the same core model on the server, essentially the same core record on the server. And if somebody updates it from over here, you see those updates live calculated on yours. And it uses WebSockets to do that because what else I guess really would you use? Mm -hmm. but it's not using Hotwire. I think maybe it would be really interesting for the next time to sort of replicate that behavior the way that we would in live view with that server event driven of like, I'm, I'm updating a record over here and all of the browsers that are connected to that same record, see that same update pushed out to them, but using Hotwire or something like it, like replicating that kind of behavior with some of the stuff that we get either through stimulus or through something like that. Um, that might be a, an interesting demo for next time, just to mm -hmm. kind of talk through Go back to that. how we did POA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically <laughs> going to go back HTML to across the channel. When I think of HTML over the wire, that's why I think of WebSockets, right? I don't think of it as being a request response cycle. I think of it as being a WebSocket that's open and getting a message. So it's interesting. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll work something up and do like a little lightning talk kind of thing on it next time. Yeah, I mean, we we did have the workings of that on the one project that we were on. Um, we just didn't have all the niceties of of like the the quick diffing and it like it was it was pretty chatty you know? yeah we were sending a lot of information across because we just didn't have all of the niceties of being able to plug into where exactly we needed to like 
but we were just sending small snippets across. So it wasn't terrible to right. just yank it out and replace. So you could, you could certainly like do a little bit of both, but yeah. Well, I think we're, we're over a bit um, here by about 10, 10 minutes. Um, anybody want to close out with anything or any, any questions, thoughts you have on it? Bill, thank you for showing some code and putting some meat to the, the conversation. Uh, I think that helped a no lot. Worries. Yeah. It's yeah, easier to so talk much. about things in the abstract, but it's easier to understand them in the concrete. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Appreciate Thomas, it. thanks for joining from France. Hey, you're welcome. It was a lucky, lucky timing. I checked the Ruby Meetup calendar online, and so there was one starting 10 minutes later. So I thought, hey, why not? Awesome. <laughs> well, as they long. say, maybe a bientôt. So. A bientôt. Merci. <laughs> All right, we'll see.